Hey guys, Jordan Belfort here. The Wolf of Wall Street in the Wolf's Den. I have another amazing guest today, a world-class trader on Wall Street, expert in options, cryptocurrency, a guy who's on TV constantly on CNBC, someone I really respect greatly. His name is John Najeri, and before I bring him on, I want to just share a couple of thoughts with you about what's happening right now in the world, and I want you to really take notice here. Just remember, just think this through, because John and I talk about this a lot. Just remember how all of this, meaning the whole COVID disaster, the lockdown, loss of our civil liberties, how it all started. It all started with an idea that if we don't do something drastic, Namely, shelter at home, in place. Don't interact with each other. Don't stop the spread of this terrible virus that kills 5% of the people. Yeah, right. I never believed that for a second. We don't stop this. We're going to overwhelm our hospitals. And because of that, the only way to save people who get a really bad case of this is through a ventilator, which means they have to be in the hospital. People are going to die that would normally not have died from this because there will not be enough ventilators and enough treatment to go around. And that made a little bit of sense to me that I never believed it. Because from what I was seeing, it just never quite added up. The numbers I was hearing about, I was unfortunate and fortunate that my daughter got it very early on and she got better right away. She had it for a few days and I started noticing very early on this trend that we all know now that it really is ravagingly terrible for older people and immune compromised people. There are people who are really badly at risk. It's a terrible disease for them, right? But for the most part, if you're young, under the age of 10, it basically does nothing to you. Seriously, once in a while, there are some complications, but it's, again, it's a lot worse than COVID for young people. And if you're in your... 10 to 20 year gap, right? That's your age. Eh, no big deal there too. Occasionally you may have one person die, but many more die of other things all the time, right? Every person that dies is bad, but let's just talk about reality here, right? And then as you start getting older and older, the symptoms get a bit more severe. And then as you cross over that 70 year old mark, it starts to get really dangerous. And even at over 60 starts to become at least semi-dangerous, right? Not a good thing. It's a real disease and it kills people. No denying that. But it was pretty clear that the idea that you had to flatten the curve to not overwhelm hospitals was a bunch of nonsense after I watched the Jacob Javits Center in New York City get turned into a field hospital and then no one basically showed up, a very few. The Mercy and the other ship came to LA and New York. Barely any people needed those ships. It became pretty apparent that there was not going to be a shortage of hospital beds or ventilators to the point that people would be dying in the aisles, unable to get the care needed. This is in no way means to not stress the importance and, and, and just the amazing effort put in by all the health professionals that treat these people. Not saying that, but it never got to this dire point where people were dying in the street because they couldn't get treatment. That was why we sheltered in place because the thesis was never that if we shelter in place, we can never catch the virus. We'll get rid of it. It'll die. No. The idea was that we'll all get it more slowly. We're going to spread this over time so the population can slowly get it and healthcare can ramp up. We can get enough personal protection uh, in place, masks and so forth in place. So, if we just slow down the infection rate, everyone eventually is going to get it who's going to get it, but at least it won't overwhelm the system in one day and people will die in the streets. Somehow, that turned into now, this has to be something that plagues us as a society and causes us to lose our civil rights in the street to be still locked at almost a standstill. Yeah, there are some big tech companies making a lot of money and I've fortunately done very well and I'm thankful for that, by the way, but it doesn't mean that I don't have empathy for all the restaurant owners and hoteliers and airlines and small business owners and gym owners and hair salons that have gotten fucking wrecked, wrecked. Years, lifetimes of hard work destroyed 
through a flawed and bullshit strategy of locking down the world and making people think that everybody's going to die of this fucking virus when it's just not true. It's just not true, guys. And the media, for whatever reason, they want you to be scared and to be terrified and for us to all hate each other and to think it's left versus right, mass versus no mass, whatever it might be, whatever that agenda is, probably if you want to get simple about it, it's because the more terrible we make it, the more people want to watch news if we have this thing about bad news, we'll tune in, they can sell more advertising dollars, and hopefully if things get really bad, we can knock Trump out of office because we hate him and everything will go back to the status quo. They're holding us hostage right now. As a society, we're being held hostage that unless you vote Trump out of office, you can't go back and get life the way you want it. We're not going to let you leave your house. We'll shut your power off. We'll shut your electricity off. We're not going to allow you to travel. You have to walk around with a fucking mask on, even though everyone knows these masks don't even work. The masks don't work. Do you know how many studies are out that it proves that the masks that people use are cloth coverings? Has anyone, like, has the world lost its collective fucking nut here? Like, the virus is not stopped by a tiny cloth covering that everyone wears. Yeah, if you have one of those N95 masks and you put it on correctly, well, it prevents you, I guess, from, from I think, from um, catching it from other people. And I don't think it stops you from giving it to other people. But these masks are nonsensical. They don't do anything. Why this is happening... I can't say. I suspect that they're trying to make us as a society so miserable that we'll just vote Trump out of office. And it's not not since I love Trump so much. It's not that. It's just, I mean, it's all, all lines are pointing north, guys. It's a terrorist situation. We're being held hostage. If you want your life back, you got to vote another way. That's fucked up. That's not the America I grew up in. It's not an America that I think we should want to live in or we should allow this to happen. The media, the, the, the mainstream media is literally directly responsible for what's going on right now. They're fanning the flames of fear. They're flaming the flames of, of division. And it's time for everybody here to take a stand as a society, whether you are left or right. We can't allow a small group of self-serving assholes to destroy what was the greatest country in the world. And it's not anymore. It's not. The way we're forced to live right now is not great. Can we get back to greatness? Yes, we can. But right now, we are not a free society anymore. We've lost our right to free speech in many cases. Maybe this will get zinged or plagued or I'll get shadow banned. Who fucking knows anymore? Although that really hasn't happened to me that much yet. I can, be, I can really be proving. But the point is, I see people getting banned all the time on platforms. I'm like, what the fuck? Is this the world I grew up in? This is not the world I was raised in or I want to live in. Or that I know you want to live in. At some point, we have to take a stand as a society, as a free society. We're not, we would draw the line here. When I hear about them cutting off water and power and electric to people, and I understand that there are some people that are like turning their homes into nightclubs. I get that. And those people should be fine because your home shouldn't be a nightclub, I guess, right? But if someone wants to throw a party in their house like once every four months, that's a very different thing. And I wonder what's the line? What line are they drawing here in LA now? I live in the hills. I don't throw parties. And what back in the day I did, right? But, you know, I wonder what is the line? When can they turn off your water and power? When I hear these things happening right now where the government is saying, we're going to do this or that. We're going to shut your power. I've heard now, I read an article. I don't know if it's true. I, I hope it's not. But I think it is that in Melbourne, Australia, the police can now go into your house anytime they want if they suspect there's too many people in your house. They can go without a warrant now. Is this the world you want to live in, really? If you're a liberal, think about this. Is this the world you want to live in? Anyway, I said my piece. So I rant for the day. I love you all, whether you're left or right. And now with that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. And then we're off to the races with John DeGerry. Finally, America is reopening its doors. If you're going to succeed, you need the right strategy and you need an edge. With NetSuite, you can make that happen. 
The bottom line is that smart companies run on NetSuite by Oracle. This is the world's number one cloud-based business system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, your HR, your inventory, e-commerce, and everything else you need all in one spot. And let me just tell you something. If you're not on top of your numbers, then your numbers are gonna be on top of you. Whether you're doing 100 million a year, hundreds of millions a year, a million a year, NetSuite lets you manage every penny with precision, bottom line. You'll have the ability to compete with anyone, work from anywhere, and run your whole company right from your phone. You wanna join 20,000 companies, 20,000, who trust NetSuite to make that happen. Listen, NetSuite surveyed hundreds of business leaders and assembled a playbook of the top strategies they're using right now as America reopens for business. You need to watch this, you need to see this. So receive your free guide. It's called Seven Action Businesses Need to Take Now and schedule your free product tour at netsuite.com slash wolf. That's netsuite.com slash wolf. Listen, you know I don't endorse a lot of companies, right? This is one I believe in. You wanna check this out. Listen, Larry Ellison, Oracle, business genius, NetSuite, best of breed software by a country mile. So if you're in business, and you're gonna at least check out these seven strategies that you need to take right now, actions. Come on, what's the worst that could happen? At least go check this out. See what the smartest business people in the world are doing right now to maximize this rocket ship up we're about to witness after coronavirus. You should check this out. So again, one more time, netsuite.com slash wolf. That's netsuite.com slash wolf. You wanna do this right now. All right, John the Jerian. So listen, uh, we have a lot to talk about, obviously, right? You're an expert's expert in all things related to the market, uh, especially options. That was your first thing that you really, uh, you know, you made your name in, right? Absolutely, Jordan. Um, you know, I came to the floor from playing pro football for the Bears. Um, I thought it would be easier than it was. It was pretty tough, um, not physically, but mentally, because I didn't understand all the technology that would have to be employed to be able to figure your risk and all that kind of stuff. Cause it's not just like wax on wax off with uh, trading stocks, trading options is a different animal. And uh, I won't kid you. I didn't get it for about the first two and a half, three months I was lost. But then after just working my butt off, you know, something, you know, a thing or two about, um, I just wasn't going to fail. I just was not going to, you know, miss out on understanding this. I wanted to get in back in the 80s, you know, when it was still in a growth phase. And luckily I did. And uh, it's paid off over time. Now, did you, were you there, like, was the CBOE you were at in the Chicago? So did, were you there, like, back? So in the beginning, I don't think people really realize this. It was only call options in the beginning, right? I mean, it was in the very beginning when it first started, right, it was very small. There was no computers, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, folks, exactly what Jordan's describing for you um, is what it was like. Uh, when I got there, Jordan, I think there were put options. Put options are the right to sell something, folks. Calls are the right to buy. Um, put options were maybe listed on half the securities by then, Jordan, but uh, when they started listing put options, that confused even more people, even though that's the easiest side to understand. We all have, you know, car insurance, life insurance, things that you'd be an expert at selling. <laughs> Can we, can we can we go back a step, John? Can you explain to everybody here, explain to the audience, this is really important, because I'm sure a lot of them probably want to dabble in options because they you can make a lot of money if you're on the right side, but most people, I think, lose. I think p people mostly, I remember when, when I was on Wall Street, they'd say, yeah, options uh, are invented by people who, who write them, they make the money, and those who buy them, 99% expire worthless, basically, right? But explain... Give it the layman's version of what it means, what an option is, how it works, and how the whole thing goes, basically. Sure. Well, they're especially popular right now, folks, because of what Jordan just said about um, it's a derivative 
um, which means that uh, it is not stock itself. It is the right to buy stock, for instance. A call option um, gives you the right to control shares of Apple, for instance, instead of putting, um, right now, Jordan, uh, 1,000 shares of Apple's 350,000 bucks, right? Because 350, I'm sorry, 450 bucks a share. What am I thinking? 450 bucks a share, so it's $450,000 to buy a 1,000 shares of Apple right now. But you could buy the right to buy Apple right where it is at 450 bucks a share. And if you pushed it a month out, it would probably cost you 15 or $20 per option. Um, every option's for 100 shares of stock. So that investment might be only 15,000 versus 450,000 to buy the stock. But when you buy the stock, you own it. As long as that stock's still there, you own it. You get the dividends, you get all that stuff. If you own the call option to buy Apple at 450 for one month, you have 30 days and that clock is ticking like this. And as it goes by, that's why Jordan said, so many options finish worthless folks. It's probably in the high 80% finish worthless. But at some point during that options life, it may have been in the money by a lot. And then because stocks go up and down, maybe the option finished out of the money. So it's all about managing your risk, understanding time decay, which is you know what happens over those 30 days from now till September when those 30 days pass, that option is something or nothing. And if it's so, nothing, you lost 15 yeah. grand. Do you recommend, so no, to, to restate that, so I think everyone has really good explanation. So basically, in other words, you buy an option and the option by definition will always have an expiration date. Yes, sir. At some point, the option is basically no longer you lose that right. You're buying the right to do something, right? So Correct. if there's if it's a 30 day option, right? That means that every single day, it, the value is getting less the time value component, right? So every option's compi comprised of two things, in intrinsic value plus time value, right? So if the stock, let's say you have a stock that's trading at 450, let's make, let's use lower numbers. The stock, the stock that's trading at 40 bucks a share. If it's, a, if, if you have the right to buy the stock at $35 a share, that means it has a current intrinsic value of $5, right? Five bucks. Because that means you could buy this. Someone has to, someone who issued that option has to give you that option, that stock at 35, and you could turn around and immediately sell it and lock in a $5 profit. That's the theory, right? Yep. And that's the fact, too. And then on top of that, saying, but. Since I'm giving you this also, you have 30 days, you pay a premium on top of that $5, right? And yep. so let's say it might be another two or three or whatever dollars on top of that, which represents the time value. And every single day that will kind of decay a little bit, right? Getting down to where it drops off really, really quickly at the end. And then if you're out of the money, meaning if the stock is below the call, it's worthless. If it's above, then it's got some intrinsic value in that you can collect, right? Right. So for instance, um, last week, folks, uh, Apple was trading at uh, 380 bucks a share. And then they had earnings and the stock spikes up to 400, 410, 415, and it has kept going. Well, if you had the right to buy it at 380 and it runs up to those numbers, now you've got something that's worth a lot of money. There's no way you can make as much money trading stock when you're right as you can making money trading options because you've got leverage on your side. Sure. Now, do you recommend that for, um, let's say, I wouldn't say just a beginner, but someone that's pretty, you know, uh, has some, you know, acumen in trading options. Would you recommend, is, should it be 30 days? Should you buy out for 60 days? Not, what do you recommend is the best uh, sort of sweet spot when you buy options, time value wise? Um, a lot of what we do, Jordan, is following what we call smart money. So we're looking for the whales, you know, somebody that's committing tens of thousands of shares, maybe hundreds of thousands of shares to a position. And so we want to coattail those people. Most of those people are trading in options that are 30 days or less. But that is also just as Jordan said, folks, the steepest part of that decay curve. 
I mean, you can practically hear the value of that option decreasing as time goes by, just like a ticking of a clock. So it's traders on the floor, Jordan, used to go <laughs> like you're escaping a balloon because literally that option is, you know, just deflating as time yeah. goes by. It's, it's almost like that, like the cartoon, by the way. How about the, the cartoon with the ticking time bomb that ticks faster and faster as it gets down to zero, right? It's like, it explodes, right? That's it. <laughs> exactly right. And so, <laughs> this, you know, if I were to counsel an investor on what they should do, I'd say more or less being out there 30 days to 90 days is the sweet spot. But when you're following somebody that thinks that they have either insider information or better information than you've got, because they've got people at the William Blair conference or at the Morgan Stanley conference sure. listening to whatever the you know CEO is saying, then uh, I trade based on those smart guys that have you know a staff of twenty people, ten of which yeah. are always going around the country to those conferences to listen in on any tip that might be something that leads them into a explosive move in the stock. Got it. Now, one of the things about options that I've always been intrigued by is that they, they typically are more, let's say, let's say that the pros are not typically just buying an option. They're using strategies that are a bit more complex and they're more based on hedging and sometimes being on both sides of the trade, like straddles or whatever that might be. Now, can you explain, do you, do you do some of those strategies? Do you teach people those strategies? And, and do you believe this one that really is, what would be the easiest one for someone to start using to make money, in your opinion? Easiest one is just buying one option, for instance, at the uh, 40 strike to use Jordan's level of a stock, which might be like an Uber. Uh, maybe you're buying the 40 strike call and you sell the 45 strike. So you've put out premium, you've paid for that 40 strike, the right to take the stock at 40, you've given somebody else the right to take it from you at 45 and you got paid for that. So that decreases the amount of money you've got at risk and you've now got a leverage trade between 40 and 45. That's probably the simplest, we call that a call vertical spread or a bull call spread. And so if you're bullish, if you're on the right side of Jordan's table there, folks, and you've got the bullish feel, you put on that trade. If you've got a bearish feel, you buy a put and sell another put under the market so that you can profit from a downward move in the market. And we all know, because we see it all the time, Jordan, stocks go down faster than they go up. So a lot of the smartest traders on Wall Street really understand puts because they can make a lot of, I mean, Think of how much money was made in March on the put side of the market, but then vaporized in April, May, June, and July so far. Very good friend of mine was one of the top, I'm sure you know him, I don't want to mention his name yet, but because uh, it was a, a bad situation, uh, but he had one of the most successful hedge funds in the country, uh, one of the top performing last year, and he was uh, essentially uh, had a strategy, he was based on volatility, he was trading the VIX, and um, I, mean, I know you know him, I still want to mention his name, he was one of the earliest traders on the CBOE, uh, he was one of the first traders there, in, in, back in the beginning, and uh, he was basically um, having people buying spiders, which are like the S&P, the exchange traded fund, right? And then they you put that and he had that as margin. He trade volatility around that, and he'd been getting extraordinary returns for many, many years. And then what happened was he got screwed when COVID hit, and all the firms started increasing their margin requirements, and they froze the market out. So um, I guess my question is: is that for most people, like him, he's a professional. Right. I mean, he had like become impervious to the emotional side of trading. How often do you see younger traders and like, like all these Robin Hood people that are out there right now, right? That they end up succumbing to the emotional side of trading. Even when you're telling them what to do, they go against, like they can't maintain that discipline and they end up losing all their money. Not because the strategy was wrong, because they just can't emotionally handle it. Do you see that happen often? All the time, all the time. Um, you know, there. you and I know fear and greed drive the markets. Um, there's no greater driver than fear and greed. And um, 
traders that have been successful, and I, I, I know you have been. Um, I have luck, been lucky enough to be successful. You've got to have discipline. You've got to be able to cut the losses. You've got to be disciplined about taking profits too, um, because it doesn't matter if you think that Tesla is overvalued. Um, it doesn't matter if you think that not everybody's going to own an iPhone or not everybody's going to advertise on Facebook anymore. But if you want to fade those moves, you're going to wind up broke. Um, you've got to set a limit to how much you can lose when you're wrong. Um, to the extent that you do that and to the extent that you take money off the table when you're right, you'll be at this as long as you want to be at it. But if you let the market, you know, I guarantee you, Jordan, so many people have been carried out feet first in all three of those stocks, in Tesla, in Apple, in Facebook, because they just keep saying, well, look, Disney just left Facebook. That's the biggest advertiser on Facebook. Oh, my God, the stock's going to go down. Oh, yeah, well, it's $40 higher than when Disney, you know, bailed on it and so forth. So you've got to set, you know, very strong limits to how much pain you're willing to take because you can run out of money before you're right. Um, that's one of the bad things about, you know, trading is that you can, your thesis can be correct. Elon Musk might never make enough money back to uh, justify the level that, you know, Tesla's at right now. But do you have enough money to stay short that thing? It was 300 bucks a year ago. It's $1,500 today. How much money do you have? How many, right. you know, how many phasers did you drain trying to, to, to kill all those Klingons or whatever the hell? <laughs> You know, one of the things I, I, I always marvel at with people that don't really understand trading and they just kind of dabble and they get killed is they say like, well, I don't, I'm not really losing money until I sell it. I'm like, yes, you are. <laughs> like, you got to mark that shit to market every day in your own mind. And it's like, I think what happens with a lot of people is they love the idea of taking a profit, right? And then, so they end up selling their winners quickly to take profits, but they don't want to sell their losers because they felt, well, as long as I haven't sold, I haven't taken. So they end up with a bag of shit, okay, because they end up holding on to their losers and they get emotionally attached because they love the ideas. You said they'd say, well, I, I must be right. My thesis must be right. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, at any given day, you have to look at the investment and say, it doesn't matter what price I paid. It's about what's it worth today, right? So when, you, when you're doing this yourself or you're teaching people how to trade, do you make – like one of these big things is this emotional attachment to the investment itself. Do you, well, how do you counsel people about that? We tell them don't have any emotion about it. Um, I know that's easier said than done. We both know that. But when you're trading, um, these aren't my kids. Um, you know, my kids, my wife, okay – that's family. I'm not going to cut them loose. But everything else in my life, I can cut loose. I mean, I don't get married to a position even in Apple. I love Apple. It's my biggest position. But, um, you know, at some price, I would let go of Apple right now. Now, is it the right time to do that ahead of a four for one stock split? Probably not. I think as we go into this four for one stock split, a lot of people want to own Apple. Um, so I might lighten up just before that split occurs at the end of this month. I might lighten up for the first time in years because eventually, Jordan, I think we're going to see a 10%, 15% correction in Apple. But again, I'm not married to it. It's not my kid. If my kid has a problem, um, if whether it's, discipline problem, whether it's, uh, you know, they're, uh, they, they have a drinking problem or whatever, I'm going to get them help. I'm going to get them fixed because they're my kid. On the other hand, if Apple has a drinking problem, I'm going to cut Apple loose because right. I, I've seen Enron. I've seen, um, you know, uh, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. Some of those were real companies. One of them wasn't. I bet your listeners know which one wasn't a real company, but two of them were real companies, but they got right. caught over levered 
and right. they went to zero basically. Right. If for those of you who didn't know, it was Enron was the <laughs> that was I remember that boy. Wow, that was unbelievable. Let me ask you this. It's an interesting thing. Um I look at the market right now and I, I remember like, you know, I, I, like most people, like, you know, we always have this morbid curiosity about bad news. So when the shit really hits the fan, you always watch the news more when things are going bad and, and try as I, as I, as I did back in the day, you know, when COVID was really, you know, every day, the ticker, the death ticker was like, I mean, like, and I, like everyone else was transfixed and watching what's the latest thing, right? I'm not proud of that, but I did, right? Um, but what amazed me is it seemed like there was a decoupling of the market to the economy. Like one would expect based on the level of unemployment now, the, the fact that I just know on Main Street, like you walk down Main Street and you see the economic carnage with lots of small businesses being closed. And, and you know, I, I hear stories from people who lost their jobs. And, and obviously, the economy is not in the spot it was in pre-COVID. Yet the market has not reacted. I mean, it did a little bit in the beginning, but then it bounced right back. And NASDAQ's making new highs, right? So what do you owe that to? Do you owe it to the way the market calculates it based on a few big tech companies who have benefited? Is that what it is? And the overall, is that what it is, John? That's exactly it, Jordan. I mean, if I wanted to set up um, an index like Dow Jones or the S&P that would reflect the economy, um, I wouldn't have Apple and uh, you know the Facebooks, and I wouldn't do it capitalization weighted because uh, those stocks they don't require face to face. You know, exactly. you sitting in a restaurant, you going to a hotel room to Marriott or Hyatt, you getting on American Airlines, United Airlines, Delta. You know, any of those face to face things, they're like two percent of the market. They're a very small percentage. Meanwhile, luckily, if you're trading the Nasdaq. Those stocks are capitalization weighted. So when Apple goes to one and a half trillion dollars, it moves the market. You know, that is the tail wagging the dog. You know, it, it will totally flip the market just based on Apple. It would do the same to the downside, by the way, when Apple does eventually have a bad day. Um, no matter how well the rest of the market does, the market will suck that day because Apple's, you know, so big, Google's so big. Uh, Facebook is approaching, you know, the, the, that sort of level too. But Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, those stocks are going to whip the market around. And right now they're benefiting from, we're all home. We're watching TV all the time. We're doing Google searches. So Google makes it on Facebook. They make it on, I'm sorry, Google makes it on searches. They make it on cloud. Uh, they make it on YouTube. Um, what does Apple make it on? Storage, you using that iPhone and sending up all your pictures into storage, whether it's TikTok, Facebook, or whatever. If it's done from your iPhone, Apple's making money on it. And then they make money from selling all those apps and all the rest. They make 30% on whatever Jordan Belfort creates. If you're selling it through the App Store, they're making the money on that. And they have all the data on how we use stuff so that people could target ads and all the rest. So I think if we wanted to set up um, a stock market that was reflective of the economy, we could do it. Um, nobody has wanted that for 100 years. You know, back when it was uh, Western Union uh, and uh, railroads and the Pony Express, yeah, that was reflective well, of Main Street. I, I guess that, you know, it used to be, there used to be a saying before I was, I think it was before I was born or when I was very young, what's good for General Motors is good for the country, right? And I think that's sort of an idea, but you know, what happened with globalization and you know, it's no longer, it's like almost like what's good for these companies is not necessarily good for the country because A, they're not paying taxes anymore because they've got you know, uh, shelters in Ireland and whatnot. Some of them, not all of them, many of them, right? Um, manufacturing is happening overseas, which is draining wealth from this country and transporting it to other countries, right? I mean, and lifting up them e economically. What do you, do you think that's a good thing? I mean, what, what do you think just economically for the guy on Main Street right now? Um, do you think it's something to be 
angry about or just to take note of and say, well, this is the world as it is. Maybe I need to just figure out how to play better in that world. What do you think about that? I think you're, you're seeing both candidates for president starting to push back really hard against some of that uh, exporting of those jobs and so forth. Um, you know, it's probably one of the few areas, Jordan, that uh, Biden and Trump are on the same page about. They both distrust China. Trump needs China because we have such a relationship with them that you'd rather not break it. But um, he wants a lot of those manufacturing jobs back here. He wants medicines that are deemed essential to Americans, whether it's aspirin or Tylenol or whatever, made here, not made over there for you know a fraction of a penny less, uh, but they make billions and billions of pills every week. So you know it ends up being real money. Um, I think there's gonna be a reckoning when more and more people realize that the more globalization occurs, the more Americans that expect a little bit better wage and a little bit better working conditions, the more uh, that that's going to be hard to get um, in a truly globalized world. Um, one of the ways around that is, you know, sort of like what Europe does, they put a VAT, a value added tax on it. So anything you or I buy, it doesn't matter if you're rich and you've got a jet, um, you've got to put fuel in the jet and they're gonna hit you on with a special tax on that. They're gonna hit you with a VAT when you buy the jet and all that kind of stuff. The reason that hasn't come over here yet, it's, we're getting closer, but the reason those value added taxes haven't come here is that it's just one more tax. So in other words, we already pay a lot, Jordan, like uh, I don't know if you're in New York or New Jersey or if you've been- California is terrible. Oh, California, I was gonna say. I was moving. I, I was move. thinking maybe you'd already moved to Florida from I'm the going East to. <laughs> down there because, yeah, California hits you for 10 or 11 percent. More even. I think the problem with the VAT, though, for some people is they consider it to be aggressive, you know, uh, um, on people that have lower incomes. So what do you think about that? Well, I think it's more um, the, the, the really rich people that consume a lot of stuff would end up paying a lot more taxes. And because they're rich, they'd pay um, uh, more of a fair share. I mean, for instance, Warren Buffett can pay himself a buck a year, right? He can say, my secretary pays more in taxes than I pay. Yeah, because you don't pay her a buck a year, do you? You know, you pay her 80,000 bucks or 100,000 bucks, probably some shares of uh, Berkshire as well. But he consumes a lot, I guarantee you. Not when he's driving around in an old pickup truck in Omaha, but when he gets on his jet and flies out to his California place, I guarantee he consumes a lot more, but he's not paying taxes because he's just clipping coupons. You knew those people. I mean, right. those would be guys you'd love to call if you could get them right. you know, to pick up the phone because you know, those guys have a lot of dough, but they made it years ago and they don't need to pay themselves a salary. They just draw out of their savings what they need. And they've got all this stock that just keeps appreciating in value like, you know, knock on wood Berkshire has done. And he doesn't pay taxes on that until he sells it to your point, just like you don't take a loss until you sell out of it. Um, if you're long a stock that's down, if you're long a stock that's running, like, you know, knock on wood me for uh, Apple, um, I'm not paying any taxes on Apple, zero. And it's gone from 155 bucks where I was lucky enough to buy a lot December of 2018 to now 450 bucks. But I've paid right. zero taxes on that because I haven't sold it. And th th theoretically, you could actually put that into a margin account or just borrow against that tax free essentially, right? Yep. And, and get some money without selling it, right? Exactly. So to Jordan's point, folks, you could, uh, and Goldman Sachs does this all day, Jordan, as you know, um, the biggest uh, investment banks on Wall Street call the big insiders in Google, Facebook, um, Amazon, Apple, you name it. And they say, I'll give you a 95% loan to value. So in other words, they'll give you 90 plus percent of the value of your stock 
Um, and then they'll put a collar around it. They'll buy a put, sell a call. They're holding your stock. They're not going to lose any money. And they're charging you 2% or whatever for that. You're writing off the 2% because it's a business expense. As long as you are borrowing it and putting it into a business or something, what's better than that? You're not paying taxes and um, you have all this money sloshing around that you can invest in other businesses and diversify. To the average person, do you, what do you think the path to wealth is through the stock market? In other words, do, do you think it's, it's an important thing for the average person to become proficient at, to some degree of trading and, and t- taking the money they earn and putting that to work in the market? Is that, is that a path to wealth in your opinion? Or is it best to just turn the money over to professionals and let them do the trading for you? Um, I would think that you turn it over to professionals once you have way too much, once it's more than you can handle, um, that most of us are going to do a better job managing our own money than some professional is. But when you are that rich, you've got other distractions. You know, you've got this business to invest in, or you've got, you know, this hobby of racing 12 meter boats or whatever, or, you know, uh, collecting vintage aircraft or Ferraris or whatever it might be, buying a big yacht, Jordan, you know, something you know more about than me, um, you know. And sinking them. <laughs> and sink, well, the captain sank it. I know. <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, a lot of most people, if they wanted to pay attention to it, could learn and could do a better job than a professional would do for them, um, unless it's a really big pile of money. A really big pile of money, a regular investor, um, like let's say that you started, um, you know, whatever, SJM Incorporated, and all of a sudden you make a billion dollars from it. For you, investing a billion dollars is going to be a lot tougher than trading because you need to be in some private equity. You need to have, a, you know, some bonds in your portfolio. You want to have some cash flow, some good dividend yielding stocks and all that stuff. It's a full-time job on a billion dollars. But on 20000 bucks, on 50000 bucks, I think people can do better. And for the most part, all those big pros on Wall Street aren't looking for those guys anyway. They're not looking for that $50,000 guy. They're looking for the $50 million guy who wants to go collect Ferraris and uh, live in Aspen. So how would you advise that guy with the 50,000? What, what's the first step for them? What's, what, where do they get educated, number one? Uh, and where should they trade? Any recommendations on that? Um, these days, Jordan, uh, the trading side of it's the easier answer, and that is almost everybody's almost zero commissions. Certainly for stock, um, you can find plenty of places. Robinhood, you spoke of already. Um, my brother and I are part of one that I can't talk about right now, but next time we talk, I'll be happy to talk with you about it. Um, but those kinds of things where it's zero commission, um, I think that means that there's almost no friction for the guy getting in and out of the stock. You know, you want to buy Apple and get out of it tomorrow. If it's in a tax-free account, like an, a Roth IRA or something, no problem. You know, it's almost no friction if there's not commissions that are eating up, you know, $75 in, $75 out. And you keep doing that all day. All of a sudden it's, you're paying hundreds of dollars a day in commission, but with zero commissions, And that's coming to options too. zero commissions is Um, I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that people should be exploring as far as where to learn it. um, uh, You know, that's a shameless plug for me. No, I want I want to hear that because I know you've written books and you teach stuff. So tell me about that. I want want you to talk about that and then really, you know, explain about, you know, your philosophy and and what you think, especially the first step is. So the first step would be um, that they need to just start learning. And we do it distance learning, so people do it just like we are, we are right here, except instead of me being there or you being there, it's a recording of Jordan Belfort, and he's telling you, just like you do with sales, we're doing it, here's how you trade. Um, but we're not telling you to go out and do it yet. Just like you wouldn't 
tell somebody, okay, here's how you sell. And by the way, before you finish this next chapter, go and try to sell a bunch of stuff because you'll make a bunch of mistakes. And in the case of trading, you'll make a bunch of mistakes that'll cost you money. In the case of selling, I guess you could make a bunch of mistakes and blow some friendships or some doors that would be closed because you did such a crappy job, they don't ever wanna see you again because you hadn't finished Jordan's plan on how you do this or John's plan on how to trade. So we give um, basically chapter after chapter online that people sit through at their own pace and then they say, oh wow, I see how this works. Okay, right. let, me, let me do a paper trade. Let me not put my money on the line. Let me just, you know, Market Rebellion taught me how to trade. Let me see if I write down the prices right now. I kind of like the way Uber is acting ahead of earnings. Let me say I buy this at the money call and see what happens without really buying it. But let me write down the price and track it for a few days and see what happens when I'm wrong. It's very tempting just to ride it, like you said, never take a loss until you sell it. But um, we're going to be hammering on them, you know, cut that loss, cut that loss, cut that loss. When you're wrong, you don't have to admit it. You just cut it. That's the nice thing about trading. When I did it, yep. Jordan, yeah. when I did it on the floor, um, just like, you know, when, when you were on the phone selling and you got a whole room full of guys excited about how you're doing, that was like what it was for me on the floor trading, except all those guys are rooting against me. <laughs> they don't want me in that pit. You know, I'm standing there in this pit because I rented a seat for 10,000 bucks a month. So I'm standing there and I'm buying calls and they're all hoping I lose because then I'll be right. gone the next month and it's less competition. So right. um, yeah. to, to have people watch you fail is tough. And that's why I think traders on the floor, it's one of the toughest things to learn. But once you do, and you can just shrug it off and let it go off your back, you just start hammering out losses and just saying, okay, I bought these at a buck and a half. They're down to a buck 25, gone you know, move on to the next trade. And if you can yeah. do that, then you yeah. can be a real winner. Yeah, the first thing I was taught in trading was your first loss is typically your best loss. And the longer you belabor that, you know, you end up getting yourself into trouble. You know, it's, uh, you know I say averaging down, you know, it's tough, you know, averaging up the whole world's telling you you're right. So those are some of the early lessons I learned on Wall Street, even retail, you know, when you're trading retail and stuff like that. How, so what's the name of the system that you teach? Is there a name to it? Or is there a website? Um, if they go to marketrebellion.com forward slash get started, they can see all the different things we do because uh, we teach people about options, beginning, intermediate, advanced. We do the same thing for stock the same thing for futures, the same thing for cryptocurrencies. So, you know, a lot of folks um, are right now, I think a lot of those Robin Hoodsters are also speculating on uh, Bitcoin and Litecoin, Stella, uh, you know, a whole bunch of these kinds of uh, cryptocurrencies, Ethereum. Um, and I'm not saying they're wrong to do it. I mean, the government is making our money worth less, not worthless, but worth less by all this <laughs> printing. And this is a nice hedge. And I think a lot of those Robin Hood types have figured that out, that they'd like to have exposure to something that nobody else can make worth less just by printing more money. Before we go on to crypto, I want to talk to you about crypto. Um, one of the things I've noticed out there as I went around the world and I, you know, before in pre-COVID times and even really, I, I already kind of stopped doing it before that, but there's this big seminar circuit around the world where people get up on stage and now a lot of it is online and there's guys that teach real skills. Like I teach sales and some guys teach marketing. Um, but there's a whole bunch of people out there that sell these currency trading courses. Um, and, you know, they talk about these wild, exaggerated gains of like, you know, 
3,000% a year. And like, you know, and we all know that's just impossible because, well, if it's making 3,000, why don't you just take a hundred bucks of your own money and uh, just do it yourself and you'll never have to sell a course again as long as you live. But what is your, right? What, and I, and you know, the well, well, like, you know, that would, you know, we want to share the wealth, right? But what do you think about all those, you know, the, 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 the FX side, you know, the, the currency side, it's like, is, um, uh, it's, I just seen a lot of stuff, let's just say. I want to say good or bad. What's your thought on that? I think that's the deepest water in the pool. I mean, uh, when we talk about deep water, folks, we're talking about people that have an awful lot of expertise. You can blow yourself up so fast in foreign currency trading, FX trading, like Jordan said, because, uh, you know, Routinely in the United States now, Jordan, I think it's limited to 50 to one leverage, <laughs> 50 to one. Uh, but overseas, they routinely have 200 to one leverage. And that's crazy. That's way too much leverage. Can you explain what that, can you explain what that means to everybody? Sure. So in other words, that, that you think the British pound um, versus the U.S. dollar, they call it a cable trade. Um, because it's been called that forever. So the British pound is trading for, let's say, a dollar thirty-one U.S. dollar. We all know what that means. If you want to go buy a stake over in London um, and you exchange the U.S. dollars, you, you, it takes a dollar thirty-one one British pound, um, and then it, you know, you flip it around and they want to here and so forth. So if you want to bet that Britain is going up, that the pound is going up in value, you can do it. But uh, the people that do that are banks and global trading institutions. They're going up against them. Um, and it's also, they could trade that anywhere. It's not like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or most of the U.S. market where you actually see the volume. All you do is fast trade um, in FX. You're not seeing volumes pulsing up and down or big blocks unless you're one of those guys. It's like NASDAQ was back in, in 1988 and before, when we had the, before, the national market system was real. To, what, what year did you get into the market, by the way? What year? 1981. Okay, so you know, remember the NASDAQ before 1980 or 90, the NMS was the only one that was real time. You used to actually, and it was crazy by the way, oh my God, I don't even wanna go there, let's keep it. But you know, you used to, it would be like at the at all day long, you'd watch it go up and down and not knowing what was really happening. And at the end of the day, each market maker would punch in their high and low volume and the volume would actually pop on and you had no idea what happened all day. That's what the currency is like right now. That's what the currency is like right now. And it doesn't matter if it's, dollar yen or euro to the dollar or what it is you know swiss franc yeah. you know those are some of the biggest markets on earth and the people that i mean if you traded small enough and you had uh you know i guess jordan for instance in great britain and much of europe people are much more focused on foreign exchange Probably for a whole bunch of reasons. They are, yeah, it, that's for sure. And I noticed that when I went around the world, it's much more attuned because it used to be so many different currencies in the, you know, before the EU, right? Yeah, certainly so, yeah. That's exactly right. And because when you're in Europe, you know, it used to be when you're crossing borders, you're always exchanging. Um, so for everybody to become a little bit of an expert, they're going, God, last year at this time, you know, the, the Euro was trading 116. Now here it is at, you know, 120 or whatever, uh, maybe it's overvalued that, you know, all these thoughts that go through. Right. Some of them thought it was going to go to parity with the dollar, you know, one to one. So that one sure. euro was one dollar and all. So they'll bet on that. They'll also do it because they don't have stock markets. I mean, they do, but their stock market, Jordan, um, we trade more in the first 10 minutes in the United yeah. States than all yeah. of Europe trades combined. They don't mm. trade. I mean, they buy big companies. They hold them for the dividends. For the most part, individuals rarely trade because the stocks are too big. So instead, and they don't do the fractional trades and all that stuff like we have here now. Um, so instead of buying Siemens over in Germany, they do FX trades, a little 
FX trade, you know, $5,000 here and there. Japanese um, housewives are famous for watching the, the yen and trading the yen a little bit back and forth and things like that. But I'm with you 100%. I think it's deep water, dangerous trading, way too much leverage. Um, and uh, I can think of a lot better ways, at least in Vegas, they buy you drinks. <laughs> They don't That's buy you drinks true. in FX. So you can put on a little FX trade here and there, and that's great. But if you ever want to start getting into the tens of thousands of dollars in FX, you really need help. Before yeah. Let's go now to the opposite side of the equation of, the, of a much shallower pool, which would be a cryptocurrency. Obviously, it's an infinitely more shallow pool than global currency markets, right? So number one, you know, and back in the day, uh, I'll tell you my, my own personal journey in terms of my uh, thoughts on cryptos. I was very bearish early on because I saw Bitcoin's rise and I said, that is just a disaster. Not Bitcoin and not blockchain. The inflationary aspect of what was going on, I thought was very dangerous. It was obvious to me that it could not end well at, you know, as it ran up to 20,000. And I had a, I, I called it close to the top, almost at the top. I was kind of lucky a little bit. You know, it's luck somewhat. It could have gone higher. But I was like, I made a real, I said, this is a piece of shit, basically. And then it cracked down. And I, I thought it would vanish. And the reason I thought it would vanish is mostly because of government regulation. I, I My big concern was that... The government, especially the U.S. government, worked so hard to stamp out money laundering, and I know personally, right, and Switzerland and, ha and tax havens. The idea that they would all of a sudden say, oh, okay, hey, you guys want a, another vehicle? Go ahead, just grab it. So I, I never thought it possible that I said if Bitcoin worked too well, it would cause its own demise. It would almost precipitate regulatory action. So I never saw it as a possible um, vehicle for the long term. What I did think was going to happen was that governments themselves would use that technology and issue their own cryptos that were basically government-backed cryptos. I thought that's where it would go. And I think China is doing that right now. I have heard rumblings about that, right? So what are your thoughts on the future of crypto? Um, and, you know, if there is one sign there, and then also, which one do you think is the one that's the one you should trade? That the last part is the easiest part, Bitcoin. Um, and the reason, folks, that uh, Bitcoin, and I'll make it as simple as I can, but whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is, whether it was the um, NSA, CIA, or some other agency, or if it was a real person that just has gone out and hidden and disappeared with billions of dollars of Bitcoin, um, because he created um, a system using the blockchain technology to have a limited amount of a currency available. Um, and the reason he did it, allegedly it's a he, uh, did it was because he wanted uh, to rebel against the government that was at that time just running the printing press in 2008, Jordan, when the uh, you know, financial crisis hit. How did we get out of it? We printed a hell of a lot of cash. Quantitative easing, they like to yeah. call it. <laughs> We're, you know, the, the Fed's just going to run the printing press, and it just costs you paper and green ink. That's it. Nothing, you know, and obviously somebody, you know, print, taking those plates and having the machine pull the plates on and off. Right. But so they do that. And the more dollars that you have, I mean, supply and demand drive markets. So if you have a big supply, demand usually is going down um, because you've got too much, just like right now, too many seats on airplanes. Um, I bought my daughter a ticket back to uh, Tulane University, Jordan, just last week, and it was 38 bucks on United from Chicago to New Orleans. Why? Because there's an oversupply. Nobody's flying, not nobody, right. but a very small number of Americans are flying and they have too much supply. They've taken many of their planes off the market. And obviously, when you have too much dollar uh, floating around, you're going to have the dollar worth less money versus the euro, versus the cable, versus, you know, uh, the Japanese yen or Swiss franc. So all of that happened. Satoshi Nakamoto didn't like it. So he said, there will only be 21 
million Bitcoins. That's it. That's all that there's going to be ever. Full stop, end of story. And this is how you have to get them. You have to mine them, you know, which basically means that Jordan and John, if it's only Jordan and John on Bitcoin, then every time a Bitcoin trades, I have to say, yep, Jordan hasn't spent that coin yet because that's the problem with digital currencies. People might try to double spend it, might spend you know, the same Bitcoin here and in China and in Russia and you know, so forth and so on. But since everyone on the blockchain can verify through that distributed ledger, they say Jordan's never used this currency before. It's good. It's worth whatever a Bitcoin's worth right now. And for doing that work, they reward you, the miners, with Bitcoins. And so it's very competitive because now that Bitcoin's 11,000 or wherever it is per Bitcoin, every time you win one of those things where you have verified somebody else's trade, you get Bitcoins. Um, and it becomes harder and harder to do it by design. Satoshi designed it that way so that it would take longer and longer to verify trades so that um, they would uh, uh, basically have to pay less and less Bitcoins. They just cut it in half the amount that they pay you now uh, for doing this verification process. But anyway, I would trade Bitcoin. I do own Bitcoin. I do own Ethereum. Those are the only two that I own right now. Um, I'm going to be a non-executive chairman of a uh, cryptocurrency in the very near future. Be happy to dial you in, Jordan. You'd be a perfect guy for that. Um, but this, I think it's going to be um, a very interesting time when all these central banks are printing money and making currencies worth less. I think it's going to be a great time for these cryptocurrencies. And I think many of them, not you know, probably only 5% of them or less will survive uh, because a lot of them are just jokes and some of them have way too many out there already. Um, you know, the Ripple and some of these things that are basically, there are billions and billions of Ripple coins out there already. Where is the, the, the asset gathers its value by its scarcity. So if something just, that's the other side of supply and demand. So if you have something that's really rare, like a Honus Wagner baseball card. Yeah, it can be worth 10 million bucks. It can be worth whatever right. you want, just like the Mona Lisa. But sure. if you have 100 Mona Lisas out there and you've got one of them, yeah, it's worth a hundredth of what it would have been worth. Sure. If there was one. sure. Do you think Bitcoin is better as a store of value or as a mode of transactions? store of value. And why do you say that? Because of the limited supply. Um, there are other coins that are much better on the transaction side. Ripple is one um, that is much better because they're so ubiquitous. And because, you know, you can just trade these things like water. It's a banking coin. Um, it's not supposed to go up in value necessarily, although it did. But Ripple um, is supposed to be a banking coin, literally, so that you can move the cool thing, Jordan, is when I would go uh, like you were, I, we weren't in the same circle on those lectures, but we must, I must have been one behind right. you. Or something. Right. Because I know those people you're talking about in Russia or in yeah. Europe or wherever. And when you do Singapore, Hong Kong, and when you do those, um, you can walk across the border with millions of dollars on your cell phone or on a jump drive or not even on you at all, but you just know the, the code in your head. Um, it's so much better uh, as a way to, for instance, if you wanted to go right now over to Switzerland and buy a chalet and you said, okay, I'm gonna go buy a chalet in Switzerland. Well, you do it in the FX market, you gotta turn whatever you've got, dollars or pesos or whatever into Swiss francs to buy it in Switzerland. Um, with Bitcoin, you can just be over there and somebody can just say, yeah, I'll, I'll sell this for X amount of Bitcoin. Um, because people do that. They transact cars, boats, um, jets in Bitcoin. I mean, and or you can go and turn that Bitcoin into cash and pay cash. That's an extra step and it'll cost you to do that. 
but there's a lot of ways that you can move across borders without all the negative impact of the value added taxes and of that FX trade. Because every time you translate sure. from a dollar to a British pound or into the Swiss franc, somebody's probably taken 2% or more out of your pocket every single time you do it, sometimes it's as much as 8%. What um what happens? You, you mentioned something. You said that you know you get the way Bitcoin works is people verify transactions and then you get paid in Bitcoin for verifying the transactions. Who verifies the transactions when you run out of Bitcoin to print? Um, all of these people, all, they call them nodes. All of these nodes where people that's their whole job. In other words. It's not like somebody taps me on the, I'm not a miner, but it's not like somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, John, you know, will you prove that I haven't used this Bitcoin before? When you try to transact that Bitcoin before the transaction goes through, everybody on the node with this so-called distributed ledger, which is really folks, just your bank account out there for the world, they say, yep, this Bitcoin has not been used. No fraction of it has been used or nine tenths of this Bitcoin has already been used. That's, you know, somebody else bought nine tenths of it. So all yeah. you've got left is 10%. My question is though, is like, you, I thought you said that then you get paid, they, they'll pay you in Bitcoin. But what happens after all 24 million Bitcoins are gone? How do they pay you? Well, and that's the trillion dollar question. Now that'll take a lot of years because of the way it's set up, Jordan, even with supercomputing, they think it'll take many decades into the future before you exhaust the 21 million Bitcoins. 21 million, I'm sorry, 21 million, yeah. And they'll have to figure out how do we do, uh, because they can make more if they want to, but here's, here's the, the thing. Who's they? Well, everybody that owns Bitcoin. So for instance, if you own Bitcoin, um, what, what Satoshi did in his genius was he said, it's mutually assured destruction, just like nuclear war. Um, if you want to issue more Bitcoins, you can. Instead of being 21 million, you can double that to 42 million. All you need is 50% of the people to say, yeah, you know, take half, of my, half the value of, take me down by 50%. In other words, you have 100 million in Bitcoin, and all of a sudden they're going to print another 21 million bitcoins, and you have 100 million. Your 100 mil will only be worth 50. They have diluted you by half. So what is what are the odds that you're going to vote for that? I would say mm -hmm. almost zero. There are some idiots out there that would say, well, but for the greater good of mankind, we need more bitcoins in circulation. Right. Well, I guess it would be, I guess it could be, it would be sort of slow dilution that would happen each time a transaction had to get verified in a Bitcoin or a fraction there had to be printed. You'd be a tiny bit diluted to keep the network going. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert at it. Well, you're, you're but, exactly right. And think of it in terms of, because when you hear it discussed, like Jordan and I have just done, folks, it might sound more complicated because I'm not as good at explaining it or whatever, but think what happens when you take your credit card. You go to the gas station, you plug your credit card in, pull it out, and in within seven seconds, uh, 20 different firms are bidding for the right to basically charge your credit card. That's the way it works. You know, whatever the point of sale or POS item is, that credit card goes in, you pull it out. Within seven seconds, they're saying, yes, John has the money in his account and he's not frozen. That's a good credit card number. And Master or Visa card, Discover, Amex has said it's good. Within seven seconds. All those firms that fought for the right to do that are exactly the same as all these nodes on the Bitcoin thing. Makes sense, yeah. For the, for the right to say you have the money and you can spend it. So right. when you think of it that way, it's not as much of a reach to get to where they need to get to. In the future, will somebody get, you know, that, because right now MasterCard and Visa make about two and a half percent of every credit card transaction. For that very reason, right? Yeah. And that's why they fight for the right. All those different firms 
are fighting on a visa, it's not visa getting, they're going to get their two and a half percent, but they're going to have to pay some of those people that basically proved to visa that you had the money in your account and they, everybody gets a little spiff. It's like six or seven people get paid every time you push that credit card in and pull it out um, to buy a trend, to buy whatever you're buying. What do you think? What do you think would be the impact on the stock market um, if Biden wins the election? Po- positive or negative? I think negative for this re- for a couple reasons. Number one, he's already said that he would raise taxes on corporations. Um, that would be perceived as negative. I'm and people vote for whoever you want. I'm just telling you what the market will think. Sure. Uh, also, Biden has proposed. Um, to pay for child care. And I can't remember if it's health care benefits or what for people that aren't presently covered, but it's a $750 billion deal. And to do that, he says that he will put on a federal real estate tax on anybody, any entity that makes 400000 or more, who would pay a federal. So in other words, if you make, let's say a million bucks a year, and you're paying California taxes, Jordan, um, which include California real estate taxes if you own real estate out there. Um, in, in addition to what you pay California, the Fed would tax your piece of property. So if California is charging you 40 grand a year to have that beachfront place in Malibu, the Fed, if you're making more than 400, this is according to Biden's own staff, the Fed would charge you as well. That's how they get that money to pay for the $750 billion for child care, which is, you know, a reasonable thing, as well as, um, uh, I think, health care uh, benefits. So I think those two things, that national tax on real estate and the increasing tax on corporations, are likely to be viewed as negative. As we get closer to the election, uh, then I think we'll have a much better idea of exactly mm. how negative, depending if he's leading by as much then as he is now. But I got a quick question for you, Jordan, if I could. Sure. I read this book on Joe Lowe, that crazy Malaysian financier. And Boy. you are featured prominently in there, not only because of the runaway success of your book and of The Wolf of Wall Street, but because uh, Joe was hosting on this huge custom-made yacht that he had. He was hosting a big party. I think you were there, probably DiCaprio and a bunch of mm-hmm. Corsese. And I'm not judging. I'm just saying, you know, that this guy, uh, uh, you immediately, at least according to the book, almost immediately as you saw the opulence and how he was spending and everything else, you said, there's no way this is legitimate because this guy has to be a fraud if he's spending money like this. Here's what I thought. It's, you, you, it's correct, but there's a bit of a twist to that. I never imagined they were stealing the money from a country. I thought they were milking sheiks. Like, I thought they were just like had, I said, there's no way this is like a real business. Like, who would they, listen, here's the story, John. They bought the rights from me and then, like, a month later, like, oh, we want to fly you to the Cannes Film Festival for the launch party. I'm like, what do you mean they haven't shot the movie yet? Like, what party? Like, they hadn't even shot one frame. So they sure, they fly my, my wife and I out there, right? And I, and I walk into the scene, and there's yachts, and Kanye West is singing. And I look at this whole thing, and I said, I promise you this is not going to end well. I said, there's no way that... This is like being run, but I didn't, what I thought though, was they were just taking in money from investors and they're being crazy Hollywood, just like, let's spend it as much as we can get. I never thought they were robbing the money from a government. How would, I mean, you would know that, right? I mean, who would ever think that, especially because it was the prime minister's grandson. I mean, I'm a nephew. So, uh, no, I'm sorry, not a uh, stepson. So it made sense. There was the story they were telling people was that they were getting all these 
m money from the uh, you know the uh, sovereign um, entities. And I'm like, all right, they're just blowing the sovereign wealth money. I never thought they actually stole that. I was kind of shocked when I, I mean, that's pretty wild that they just uh, did that. But yeah, I absolutely smell the rat right in the beginning, but I never thought they were stealing the money. I thought they were just taking it. Like, cause that's very common in Hollywood. People, you know, like they call producers schmucks with the buck. You know, people make a ton of money. They go to Hollywood, they put their money in and people just, you know, you know, milk them to death. And, but this was just unbelievable. But one thing though, if you notice, I never took any money for, I, I didn't accept any of their gifts or money. I was like, no. So I never got called down to testify because like a lot of people accepted watches and, and, and payoffs and stuff like that. I never did because I was very concerned like that. I, something just, you know, didn't feel right. But uh, I will tell you, I was shocked when it turned out that it was, they were just literally lifting money from the sovereign wealth. That was just insane. That was, oh, is that your dog? Dexter, go ahead. Dexter, we gotta get, listen, the best thing about COVID-19 is you never know what's gonna happen when you, like, on the news, some kids running behind in the, in, in the TV. You never know what's gonna happen. Let me ask you one last question, important. When you look back at this period, this one year period from like February when the whole thing started to where it is right now, who knows where it's gonna end up. What are you gonna take away from Everything that's happened, whether it's, you know, losing our civil liberties, um, you know, just the way the government reacted, this sort of, you know, this, this split between the left and the right. You know, what would you, I mean, I don't say what would you tell your kids, but how are you going to, you know, in retrospect, what do you think your takeaway is going to be from this period of time in history? Um, I, I guess it's a little bit uh, about how easily duped we are. I mean, <laughs> you and I just discussed Joe Lowe. Um, I, I think that uh, this is a, a horrible disease um, and it, we know who it affects. I think we could have figured out much better ways, Jordan, to address it than shutting the economy down for six months. I mean, again, you know, Agreed. March, April, May, June, July, August, six months. And now they're talking about no school, New York, <laughs> is the only place that is still thinking about having in-person school. The only place in the whole country, even though kids uh, need an education, some of the kids need to be checked out to make sure that they're not being uh, you know, abused because that's, believe it or not, that's something that teachers do regularly. Sure. Uh, sadly, you know, that's- how And feed them, make sure they get nutrition, proper nutrition. A lot of them get fed at school, yep. right? And I, I think we could have done a lot better job by flattening the curve, certainly, but then by putting people back out um, that weren't either living with a person who's vulnerable or that they weren't vulnerable themselves, putting them back out and saying, okay, look, we're gonna pay some of these folks that have to stay in because they're most vulnerable. We're not gonna bankrupt our kids by borrowing $10 trillion um, to keep all of us locked up for six months and bankrupt all these airlines, all these cruise lines, all these um, hotels. So many hotels, Jordan, in New York that I have big friends in the hotel business. Me too. Are easily 40% of them in New York are basically saying, look, we're shutting it down. We are just turning this thing into a park. John, I don't want to interrupt you, but I want to after just for a second, this is a really important point. I obviously agree with you 1000%. Every single word you just said, I am in 100% agreement on. And here's the thing, pretty much every really smart, intelligent, well-read person says exactly what you just said. It's like not, it's like people get this. So why are they still doing it? Why? That's what I really don't understand because what you said makes so much sense. I've been saying it, many other people say we're not alone in this, in this way of thinking, but why is it that this is being allowed to happen? And it's not just even here. I have friends in Melbourne, you know, all of a sudden the police now have the right to come into your home without question in, in, in Australia. There's a curfew after five, I think 5 p.m. I mean, 
It's like in the worst days of the Stasi in East Germany, it was never this bad. Why? When what you said makes so much sense and there's so many people like us, why is this happening and why is it being allowed? Is there any answer to that? Um, fear. Uh, fear is just like we started the broadcast. Fear and greed. Um, I'm not saying that the greed part is the driver today. Today, the driver is fear. And if, if you and I say that, what we just said on television, then we're accused of being greedy. Jordan and John are accused of being, oh, you don't care about grandma. You, you know, you want to kill all these old people. No, I don't. Um, my mom probably died of a COVID-related thing last year. It wasn't COVID-19. It was probably one of the prior ones, but she had all the symptoms. They didn't test. She got pneumonia. Um, they couldn't get her out. Uh, so she basically, you know, succumbed to the, that pneumonia. Um, however, if you and I say it, then we're greedy and the other people that are fearful are just going to, you know, again, it's going to be politicized, as you said. It's, it's terrible. But right now, Jordan, in um, Sweden, Norway, Finland, uh, the Netherlands, you don't have to wear a mask. They tell them, don't even wear a mask. It doesn't matter. Meanwhile, the rest of the world, they're saying, Jordan, you can't even walk outside without a mask. If you do, 10 different people will call you a cuss word and uh, you know, tell you what a miserable human being you are and that you're trying to kill their grandfather. <laughs> I, I think, though, one thing I disagree with is I think there is greed involved. It's just not greed for money. It's greed for power, greed for control. Um, and I think that is just every bit as dangerous as greed for money and destructive. And I, and I, and I, I guess, as you said, I, I really am surprised at how easily people are duped because, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, hello, it's like, are you just watching what's going on right now and yet people the fear as you said is a huge factor and i think for some reason the mainstream media is in just intent on you know i don't know whether it's their hatred for trump is just you know wants to destabilize things and if we keep people so miserable and so down that they'll just do anything to like you know it's almost like they're holding us hostage saying we will not give you your lives back until you vote him out of office and put the people that we want back in power then you can have your rights back. I almost feel like I'm dealing with a terrorist who's holding me hostage. And, you know, it's, it's a very unsettling feeling, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe it's not that, you know, I, I always try to have an open mind, John, and, but it's starting to look really like it's like all things are pointing to this one direction, you know? What are your thoughts? I, I agree. I, 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 and I think you're right about the greed for power or the greed for, uh, uh, command and control over people, which is really sad. And as you said, you know, there's plenty of examples throughout history about really bad things that have happened when people have had that much power, where they could basically say, you got to stay in. I don't think, Jordan, that the people in these big cities like New York, for instance, I don't know what de Blasio thinks. Where is he going to get the revenue now? So you've crippled your city. You've spent all the money you have, even out where you are in California, where they actually had a surplus. They've gone through the whole surplus. You guys are deficit now. And where are they going to get the revenue from? They already tax you guys in both California and New York as high as anywhere in the country. You know, maybe Minneapolis is only, you know, the next closest thing as far as high taxes. But... Where are you getting the revenue when it's just Uber Eats and nobody's going out and buying that, you know, three hundred dollars wine? You know, where where are you going to get the revenue? When, I don't know. You know, it's all online retail, and a lot of it's Amazon from outside of their jurisdiction where they're not getting the tax. I don't know Incredible. where they're going to get it. It's going to change these cities, John. What can I say other than that? You are an amazing guy, brilliant for sure. And I appreciate all your success. And thank you literally for coming on. Could you just one more time what, to get in touch with you? What's the site to get in touch with you just to look at your your stuff? Sure. And thank you for that. Um, yeah. Marketrebellion.com forward slash get started. 
Um, that's what we talk about on CNBC. That's what we post up for unusual activity. And we can show them how to uh, get it educated on stock options, futures, crypto, or um, subscribe to our stuff and just follow what we do. Good deal. Everyone, John the Jarian, legend he is. The wolf. In the wolf's den. Guys, share this with your friends and we'll talk again next week. Great episode. John, thanks very much. Good luck. Take care, Thank buddy. You. Thanks, Bye -bye. John. All right, here's the deal. So America gets back to work. You want and need every possible advantage out there to succeed in the new economy. Smart companies run on NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud-based business system. So receive your free guide right now at netsuite.com slash wolf. That is netsuite.com slash wolf.